Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hey, this is Dr. Dyke Drummond from our home in beautiful Seattle, Washington on the latest edition of Physicians on Purpose podcast. I'm here with Dr. Amelia Beakey. She pronounces it Beakey, but it's B-U-E-C-H-E-D-O, an osteopathic physician from Michigan. And uh, her website is thisosteopathiclife.com. And as I've gotten to know Amelia, one of the things we've been talking about is um, what seems to be to be a, a core difference between the disease model of medicine and finding the thing that's not working and treating it and the core philosophy of being an osteopath. I've never had a chance to sit down and talk about the philosophical difference between MD and DO before, but it's a fascinating conversation. Amelia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, and, and if you can, just give us, it's, it's like a 180 degree switch. I can say it, but I don't want to. I want you to tell us, what do you see as the difference between the standard philosophy of, a, of an MD medical, Western medical uh, doctor and the way you learn to practice osteopathy? And I think you captured the essence well. It's the focus on the health. You know, so one of our core driving philosophies is that Anyone can find disease, but it can be a challenge sometimes to focus on the health and see what's working well and how to accentuate that to see if something isn't working well that we might expect it to, how to remove obstructions to that rather than just seeing what's wrong here. Right on. And um, part of the reason that you're on the show here, Amelia, and everybody needs to know this, you're also a coach. Um, so tell us about your coach certification training and um, how you apply this finding what works in your coaching practice. Yes, coaching has been fascinating to me. I'm currently completing my certification with the Life Coach School, and there's a cohort of about 40 physicians in training right now. And what was so fascinating to me in the first class I sat in, I thought, I've been coaching my whole career. <laughs> and coaching really helps people find out what they're capable of, you know, it helps them see their greatest potential and helps them remove obstacles in their way. And to me, that's exactly in alignment with osteopathic medicine. You know, with my patients, I show them their health. You know, we look at what obstructions might be in the way and we remove them. And some people think about removing them with hands-on treatment, you know, removing obstructions in the skeletal system with osteopathy, and that's totally true, but also about removing obstructions anywhere in their life. You know, what's interrupting their health and their relationships with their work, with their thoughts, which is really tying into the coaching model with osteopathic medicine. Yeah, I remember uh, I took my coach training in the year 2000, and there were two of us in that class that were physicians. One was Francine Geyer. So Francine Geyer and I got to know each other. She's a reasonably famous coach in the physician niche, physician leadership coaching. And I remember, um, same thing, um, feeling liberated by what you do as a coach. And I've realized ever since then, I've coached uh, literally thousands of doctors. What I've realized is that our mindset as physicians is to find and eliminate the problem as quickly as possible because we do that every 10 minutes for an entire career. I mean, I only saw patients for insurance money for a decade and I counted up there's 35,000 patient visits. So to take your diagnose and treat mentality, see the one person in a crowd of a thousand who's limping and you know, get in an argument with your doctor friend about whether it's their hip or their knee, that's something you really have to fight in order to see what's going right. Um, tell me about how you get doctors to switch that mindset to, let's talk about what's going right. How do you get them to make that turn in your coaching practice? Yes, it's a definite shift of responsibility. You know, and when I think about it with patients, they want to come in and have an answer. You know, they want the diagnosis, they want the treatment in that moment. And I found with my patients, I was often saying, well, we might not know exactly what's wrong, but we're going to find out and you're going to have the answers. And I take that with me into my engagements when coaching physicians. And it can be a shift, right? Because they want an answer and they want an action line. 
And that's not really the role of coaching. The role of coaching is to identify, you know, what are their strengths, what's obstructing them, and how we can help them to get out of their own way, you know, to bring back greatness in their life. And the greatness doesn't have to be massive projects. You know, it can be simple things like how to have greatness with charting, you know, how to have greatness with my relationships, how to have greatness leaving clinic on time. And recognizing that you do have the capacity for that to be possible can sometimes be hard because we often want to blame, you know, or attribute it to external circumstances. Right. And when you find out you have the power, like you said, it's at once liberating and also a little bit scary because you then also have the responsibility. That's that Spider-Man quote, although it probably comes from ancient Greece, right? With great, mm -hmm. with great freedom comes great, great responsibility. Yeah, I, I see a lot of people get stuck in victim mode, blame, justify, complain. And mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. You can do that for short periods of time, but please let's change our actions. Baby steps are the best and celebrate yeah. every little, little thing along the way. It's another thing doctors are not used to doing. You find something that's going right, you tweak it a little bit, mm -hmm. it's time for a pat on the back. So let's practice mm -hmm. celebrating. I find that some of the hardest stuff for people to do. Absolutely, and we're trained to focus on what went wrong. You know, we get an exam, you get 97%, you don't look at the 97 correct answers, you spend time with the three, and there can right. be merit in that, you know, strengthening weaknesses. But what about when we focus on strength, you know, and how can we come from that space in a different way? and apply the capacity for victory to those areas where it hasn't gone quite as well. Victory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> victory. Oh, golly. Yeah. Okay. I'm reminded yeah. of the bandanas, the Japanese bandana with the big red sun says victory in exam mm -hmm. across your forehead. Wax yeah. off and wax off. I love it. I love it. Okay, cool. And I think like you said, we only really allow victory to be landmark things, you know, right. but what can it mean to let ourselves celebrate them along the way? And the next step is to remember that that achievement isn't what's giving us our true value, you know, that we get to decide inherently what that is and still, you know, seek the achievement because we want to, not because we're looking for it to tell us who we are or how we are. And that's been a big shift. And when that happens, you know, that's really the magic and the experience in coaching with physicians particularly. Yeah, let me check. Let me run this by you. This was uh, one of my very first free reports at the website, thehappymd.com. It's called the Satisfaction Mind Flip. And what I wanted mm -hmm. it to do was to be a head snapper for the doctors to, to change their frame of reference. And what I said was this Tell me your satisfaction with your practice over the last couple of weeks. You know, take a big breath and just think about last couple of weeks, what's your level of satisfaction, zero to 10? And what I noticed was nobody ever said zero. Mm -hmm. The people that I work with will always say, you know, my practice sucks, I'm trash, and I still love my patients. I've never had anybody say zero, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And what I said to them afterwards was, it's a three, and they say, yeah. I said, great, why isn't it a zero? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they're building this big list of all the things that give them the three, and it's only when they get done, they pick their head up and go, oh my, <laughs> now yeah. hold on to that list, right? Do you yeah. have any, do you have any, any techniques that you use to get people to make that shift? Oftentimes an effective question I'll find is why is that thought serving you? You know, so when we get to the core of what's going on and we usually think that a thought serving us means it's doing something good for us and good is a judgment call, but helping a physician to see that a thought helps keep you in a safe space. You know, our brain's job is to keep us, safe, to preserve energy, to look for ease. And even if we're in kind of a stark savanna and all the resources have been exhausted, we're often willing to stay there because we know it, you know, and even right. if one mile <laughs> over is an oasis, you know, taking that leap to the unknown is challenging. So helping physicians to see that serving you doesn't mean just bringing you awesome stuff, you know, serving you is keeping you where you are. And that one has been the most powerful in my experience. And then saying, oh yeah, my brain's picking this, even though, you know, the Oasis is available. Yeah, I find that when I'm working with physicians, about 20% of the time we have to do significant parts work. I use uh, active imagination journaling and things like that. If you, if you get hijacked and, and if, if for you listening, when you get hijacked by a voice that says you something loud and clear, like you can't do that, or what if somebody finds out, or that kind of stuff, that voice is an old voice, but it's trying to keep you safe. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though 
it can be quite distressing to be to, to want to do something different and have that that voice rein you in. By the way, you were asking about the illustration behind me. For those of you who are on the podcast, behind me I always keep a flip chart of the whirlwind. I taught the whirlwind <laughs> in episode one. <clears throat> and I have a little stick figure with a stethoscope on it. That's actually a stethoscope around his neck. Surrounded by a swirling whirlwind of like four different colors of markers. And what we do is we help, hopefully, the podcast is an experience of being outside the whirlwind. So take a big breath with me and let go of anything doesn't need to be here right now. Let's do that one more time with a little flutter lips. Let her rip. And let's step out of the whirlwind because it's really really important that physicians and other healthcare workers have a regular rhythm like a pendulum of stepping out of the whirlwind. And Amelia and I both know that coaching is one of those places because basically you're in a different headspace, different perspective. The old Einstein quote, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. We're in that different level of consciousness now, or you can be, unless you're like embarrassed about taking a breath with me. So get over <laughs> it, okay? That's what we're talking about is having a new perspective at a time when you're feeling stuck. Now, let me ask you this. I mean, one of the things that I help my clients do is to find wiggle room to create a more ideal practice right where they are with those baby steps. Mm -hmm. Most people, when they come into coaching, will say, oh man, I got to quit. My experience is that 70% of them don't. Ultimately, over six to nine months of coaching with little changes, they'll get to a place where they're, they, they don't feel like they need to leave and they'll stay put and say, you know, it, it really made a big difference. What's your experience with folks in terms of do they have to leave? Because there's a whole bunch of popular talk on the internet about how doctors are leaving their practices in droves. And you and I both know that's not true. But uh, what's your experience about helping people recover in situ? Yes, I think that's one of the biggest pieces of coaching because, again, we think the external system needs to change in order for us to stay and be happy and be sustainable. We've seen that our brain is going to keep us in the place where we are, even when those resources are depleted. So finding that way to be in that space and survive and even thrive is totally critical. And coaching is a great intervention for that. And helping people to decide how they want to feel where they are and offering them ways to recognize that there are thoughts that don't require anything around them to shift, that they can choose to bring up the feelings that will allow them to more comfortably exist in the situation that they have. And kind of the secret sauce extra side effect is that oftentimes parts of the external environment do make some shifts, you know, because when we bring different energy to our workspace, to our interaction with patients, to our colleagues, to how we communicate with an administration, they see that you know, and it often becomes reflected. And so even if you're not fighting for change, just being the change, you know, starts to shift that world around you and you don't need it to. So it's kind of a double bonus benefit. If you can convince doctors to do it, because they see that as all sorts of hippy dippy woo soft stuff, right? Sure. But <laughs> why, why choose to suffer, right? You know, that's kind of the, the proposal there. Do you think you can change your institution today? The answer is often no. No. Do you need to stay in this job or are you choosing to stay in this job for now? Yes. Okay. Would you like to suffer less while you're still there? I would, you know, and then we can segue into here are some tools. How? And again, they don't have to be dramatic. No. I love the baby steps reference. One simple thought, you know, one simple way to approach charting can make a world of difference. Right. Right. I mean, what I tell people is if, if we start to work together and you start to contemplate making a change and when you contemplate this particular change, you feel scared, intimidated, like you're going to fail, something like that, stop and look down at your feet and take a smaller step. Because ideally that first step is so small that you laugh when I suggest it. Mm -hmm. Can you do five minutes of internet research on this topic tonight after dinner? <laughs> That's your action step, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people telescope, right? Uh, yeah, and when we have a result that we don't like, you know, we have choices. We can stay, we can go, we can work for change, and all of those are possible. And during all of those, we can still be more comfortable, safe, secure, content while we're doing that. And I think that's really the hope that comes with coaching. And even if change is the thing leaving from a happy place 
rather than a disgruntled and a forced place is a much more pleasant way to go. And it builds bridges, you know, and it's a benefit to the system and to the individual. Yeah. When I'm working with leaders who refer uh, uh, physicians to me, I tell them, look, I'm not coaching them to stay. You got to know that too. You can't know what we're talking about and I won't tell you. And three, we're going to, we're going to coach them to what's best for them. And four, if they leave, it'll be clean. Yeah. No kerfuffle, kerfuffle, no pounding the table, no bad feelings. Mm -hmm. And again, it's only about 30% of the time that they actually do leave. By the way, um, the other thing I've noticed, have you noticed this, that the people who do have to leave their job always have a conflict with their boss? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty consistent. <laughs> Psychopath bosses. Yuck. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so there's a whole other subset, right? Yes. How do we work with the administrative arm? And, and it's tough, right? We can see that administrative jobs are tough. And we've seen that coaching has been used in executive levels in the non-physician world for years. And so right. bringing that into our culture, you know, has a benefit, but it does require us to be willing to see the health and to see our responsibility. And that's a shift in mindset. Right. Your attitude is a choice. And the other thing mm -hmm. that I, um, the, the key is that what, what fluctuates is our ability to recognize we have the ability to choose our attitude. Because if mm -hmm. you say, I'm going to have a great day today, it changes the day you have. Even if the events, Absolutely. if we were to have parallel universes, we would watch the events march out equally. And it's also super important when you're dealing with administrators, realize they have a, a whirlwind. Yeah. And, and their whirlwind as an administrator is a lot less fun because they don't get to hang mm -hmm. out with patients. Mm -hmm. You yeah. wouldn't trade places with them, would you? <laughs> and the doctors yeah. all shake their head, right? Yeah. And I think with choice, what's so interesting, I have an article coming out on Kevin MD on this, is if we can just replace I have to and I need to with I choose to, right. there's a massive shift in perspective and experience. And it can feel intimidating. You know, again, we want somebody else to be responsible for what we're doing, but that I choose to, you know, is a really powerful place to be. Right. And then, and then there's the S word. Don't mm -hmm. shit on you yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole topic in itself, right? Yeah. Right. Well, every single thing we've talked about, Amelia, has been a topic mm -hmm. in and of itself. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for spending a little bit of time with me and, and the folks on the podcast. I hope you've gotten something out of this. But I want you to know that if you're in a place right now where you're thinking, oh, this is a bunch of hippy dippy weirdness, okay, what I want you to know is that you can choose your experience. And one of the things that helps, I think, is a phrase that comes from improv. That's why improv is so important. It's yes and. Yes and, right? yeah. I totally agree. Today sucks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to allow this fury that I'm feeling towards my current practice to occupy my brain, specifically not when I go home and I'm with my family. And we'll talk about boundary rituals in a later podcast. So Amelia, tell the folks that are listening how they find you again. Yes, yeah, so you can visit me at my website, www.thisosteopathiclife.com. That's also my Instagram and Facebook. And I have a blog and podcast by the same name. And she does regular recruiting into coaching programs. Uh, uh, we're recording right now at a time when I'm not sure when this will come out on the internet. So we're not going to pitch your next one because it might be passed. But check out the website. Uh, stop yeah. in and say hi. I'm going to spell your yeah. last name again. B-U-E-C-H-E. -E. Yeah. And here's <laughs> to the health of all things. Right on. Right on. Thanks a lot. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too.